Hello everyone, I'm the Enforcer, and welcome to the Breaking News. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and support us on Patreon, the link in the description below. Today's Breaking News is that the Ukrainian Navy has appeared to have attacked the port of Sevastopol once more over the past few hours. Videos have been surfacing over the course of the entire day of Russian uh, naval forces and armed forces in the area of the port of Sevastopol, firing at Ukrainian kamikaze drones that are entering the area of the port. In this clip, we can see the drone racing through the fire. It appears that none of it has disabled or destroyed the drone at that moment, but we didn't get to see much video beyond that. We also saw that this drone attack was accompanied even earlier in the day by a preceding attack on the port with aerial drones. From what we have heard, there were nine drones involved in this attack, and there have been reports that all of them were shot down. Nevertheless, they did precede the naval uh, kamikaze drone attack, and we can see a video clip of the Russians attempting to intercept these drones over the skies of Sevastopol right here. You can see the cameraman zooming in as the tracer fire appears to illuminate the night sky in the distance showing the Russians attempting to destroy these drones before they can reach their targets. And then the video loops. The targets of the city of Sevastopol have remained the same throughout the entirety of the war, the military and naval infrastructure that exists within the port of Sevastopol itself. Many may or may not know this, but Sevastopol has served as the port for the Black Sea Fleet of the Russian Federation, the Russian Empire, and the Soviet Union for an incredibly long time, over the course of nearly 200 years. This is Russia's most important port, and also where one of their premier fleets is based out of. And when we look through this port, you can easily find, even on uh, satellite images, a large amount of Russia, the Russian Navy's auxiliary ships, and frontline fighting vessels, as we can see a little bit further down right about here, and I believe we'll be able to find one of their frigates right there, uh, along with a couple of others, you can see that this is a major port of the Russian Navy, and especially the Black Sea Fleet, which is the only part of the Russian Navy that is usable in this current conflict. The Ukrainian drone that we saw appeared to have been trying to enter the uh, breakwaters right through here and then into the bay. It would have had to either proceed down the bay, pretty much having to run the gauntlet all the way down here to the very end to attack Russian auxiliary vessels in this area, or even further Russian vessels way down near to the very end of the bay. They also could have attacked Russian naval assets in this area here. This appears to be the largest concentration of Russian naval ships. We can even see a Kilo-class submarine moored in the middle of the harbor right there. And destroying a Kilo-class submarine is something that the Russians would feel greatly. And also destroying a Russian auxiliary vessel would also be something that the Ukrainians would be pretty happy to see happen. And very uh, unhappy the Russians would be to see something like that unfold. However, we don't know what kind of damage has been caused at the moment. We were told that there were several kamikaze boats that were involved in this attack, along with the several drones. We have gotten reports that all of the drones may have been shot down. We haven't really heard that about the boats, however, so we're going to be waiting to see if anything did happen. And we can clearly see that the Port of Sevastopol, while being a little bit odd in its layout and not really easy to attack these targets, is a target-rich environment that the Ukrainians could benefit from attacking and destroying further Russian assets. Destroying something like a Kilo-class submarine ensures that there won't be any continued usage, especially by the Russians, of these submarines to launch cruise missiles into Ukrainian territory. And the same could go for all auxiliary vessels. The same could really go for the surface installations and bases that help to keep the Russian Black Sea Fleet running. Attacking those could also equally knock out the fleet for a good while. And so we'll be waiting to see additional information at the moment about how those attacks unfolded, and hopefully they will be successful. But at the moment, all we know is that there is an attack that is underway. Meanwhile, we have been seeing a decent amount of movement occurring around the city of Moscow, as well as inside of Belarus and around Voronezh, of the Wagner unit. <coughs> Excuse me right there. In this first clip, we saw near Voronezh that a Wagner column was on the move, and a very important thing to note here is that this, these columns, unlike the columns we saw during the coup, are completely stripped of any heavy machinery or equipment. We can see a large amount of Scooby-Doo vans and smaller vehicles, but nothing beyond that. We can also see some Euro 4320s in the convoy. 
but the Wagner has been stripped of weaponry and is now a light unit. Probably one of the lightest units we've seen in the war right now. This was also noted to be moving north up the highway um, on, in the M4 area around Voronezh. So this could be going to Moscow, this could be going somewhere else. We're not entirely sure. We also saw a similar convoy. This one was actually spotted near Gomel in Belarus. And I'll be showing you all that clip here real quick. Let me make sure I get it right there. And here's this clip as well. Once again, showing what kind of force the Wagner is now. And once again, completely light vehicles and supply trucks. We can also see them being accompanied by 18 wheelers as well. And we see, once again, a large number of Scooby-Doo vans. And then some kind of a pickup truck that the Russians produce. Don't really know the brand or make, but there is a large amount of them. And of course, entirely a light column at this point. Hell, it really just looks like a large group of random people in Russia just got together in their cars and went on a road trip. And it is showing that the Russians have gone through the process of neutering the Wagner, and they don't have the kind of weaponry that they had before the coup began. But ending that clip right there, it is showing that the Wagner group is starting to go through some ebbs and flows and some tougher times, and it appears that the Ministry of Defense has also been noting this as well and seeing some interesting changes and developments about the Wagner unit. According to the British Ministry of Defense, or the Defense Intelligence, the Russian security apparatus entered a period of confusion and negotiations after Wagner Group's 24th of June mutiny. Um, in recent days, an interim arrangement for the future of the group has started to take form. On the 12th of July of 2023, the Russian Ministry of Defense announced that, uh, announced that Wagner had handed over 2,000 pieces of military equipment, including tanks. As of the 15th of July of 2023, at least a small contingent of Wagner fighters had arrived at a camp in Bel Belarus, and we may have seen the video of that convoy right there. Um, that is the information that the MOD is reporting at, on this report. Concurrently, some Wagner-associated social media groups have resumed activity, with a focus on highlighting the group's activities in Africa. Based on recent announcements by Russian officials, the state is likely prepared to accept Wagner's aspirations to maintain its extensive presence on the continent of Africa. And this means a whole load for the results of what is happening with the Wagner unit. It appears that from what we're seeing, the Wagner may not return to combat activities in early August. They may, in fact, not return to Ukraine at all. They may start to take up supporting roles in Belarus, training the Russian military, a few hundred of them, and then the majority of the rest of the Wagner will continue to be Russia's right arm operating around the rest of the world in the Middle East and places like Syria, and also in Central Africa as well. The Wagner is a huge benefit for the Russians in these areas, and that's why we're seeing that the Russians have been trying to negotiate their way around keeping them in those areas. Because the Wagner operates outside of the Russian government. It's not an official representative of the Russian Federation, and so it can do things that the Russian government could not do in other circumstances. For example, the Wagner can uh, get partial ownership of oil wells inside of Syria and also run mines uh, for precious metals inside of Central Africa that allows them to make exorbitant amounts of wealth, and the Russian Federation can also benefit of that exorbitant wealth being generated. Not only that, the Wagner can be used as a strong arm to uh, manhandle African governments to try and turn them more into the Russians' favor and against the West, which is something that continues to destabilize the region and continues to make life very harsh for people who live in Central Africa. But this is multiple things that we're seeing that is showing that the Russians are trying to keep the Wagner around as an operational unit, perhaps not in Ukraine, but helping to keep the Russian arm operating that they have had for a decade at least at this point. And not only that, speaking of Syria, it appears that Popov, while he did pop off uh, against the Russian government a little while ago, 
He is now going to be sent to Syria. Syria is the equivalent of the Eastern Front to the Russians like it was to the Germans in the Second World War. They send all of their unwanted and unfavored people into Syria. And according to a clash report, Russian Major General Ivan Popov, recently removed from the post of the commander of the 58th Army, will be transferred to a command post in Syria. And Russia has been seen to move a lot of the unwanted commanders into Syria. And they've also been seen to, at the early part of the war, move some of the commanders that they wanted from Syria and into Ukraine, and once they failed, either they were removed from positions completely, or then they were returned to Syria, one or the other. And so it appears that they're going to be doing the reverse with Popov here, and, well, you know, it's not as bad as we actually thought it would be, in all honesty. We actually thought he was about to be completely dismissed from the Russian Ministry of Defense, but it does appear that they're going to try and keep him around in some form, in some extent, maybe because they consider he actually has value uh, in his leadership, and that leadership may desperately be needed. And, and so instead of just booting him out of the military and dis disgrace completely, they're going to just move him into Syria and put him on hold. Speaking of putting on hold, the Russian grain deal with Ukraine appears to be expiring tomorrow, as the last ship that was a part of that grain deal has left the port of Odessa today. That... That ship is carrying 15 tons of seed and 24,000 tons of corn. This deal expires tomorrow. Many of y'all know that Erdogan, the president of Turkey, has declared that once that grain deal expires and if the Russians do not extend the deal, the Turkish Navy will take up the responsibility of protecting Ukrainian ships and ships of multiple nationalities around the world as they continue to carry on the grain shipments that Ukraine has been making to the rest of the world. Many people may think that that is a bit of a joke, coming from a country like Turkey. How in the world can Turkey stand up against the Russian Navy, or the Russian Black Sea Fleet? And oddly enough, Turkey actually stands up way better than the Russians actually could if they got into a direct naval engagement. If you look at the ships of the Turkish Navy, and we'll pull this up right here, the list of active ships of Turkish naval forces is quite extensive, and not only that, they are some pretty higher-end stuff. For example, they have four I-class attack submarines made in Germany. These are very similar to the Kilo-class submarines that the Russians operate, and they only have seven submarines in the Black Sea Fleet. The Turkish Navy has 12. And so in an outright standoff in between the Black Sea Fleet, the Turks outright outnumber them on the onset. Not only that, but they have several different kinds of classes of attack submarines. They also have the Gur class, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and the Prevez class attack submarines as well. All of these submarines can be used to interdict the Russian Navy, put them on their toes. They won't really know where these submarines are as long as they are under battery power. I believe all of these are diesel electric, much, much like the Kilo class. And not only that, they can fight not just the Russian surface combatant ships, but submarines can fight other submarines. And so these 12 submarines here that are active in the Turkish Navy give the, Tur uh, the Turks a massive advantage over their Russian counterparts in the Black Sea Fleet. Not only that, but they are acquiring a new Rice-class Type 214TN submarine, but those will probably not be in service until the later part of this year, at least the first few uh, orders that will be finally be delivered to Turkey. So these won't be around for tomorrow when the grain deal ends, but if the standoff continues, Turkey is continuing to expand their naval forces and their naval efforts in the region and will continue to be able to give the Russians a significant run for their money, now outnumbering their submarines near over two to one. Not only that, but they actually have what could be considered an operational aircraft carrier. This is, of course, an LHD, which is a landing helicopter deck. It isn't a full-fledged aircraft carrier, but it is a lot more than the Russians have in the area. In fact, it's really a lot more than the Russians have even on paper. The Admiral Kuznetsov would not be usable in the Black Sea, considering that it's a part of a northern fleet near the Arctic, and also it is largely out of operation. It's currently in refit right now, but this little ship right here, but it's actually not that little, it displaces 30,000 tons, the Anna Delu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, carries a decent complement of equipment, and I'll show y'all what kind of aircraft this thing carries. It can carry the the famous Bayrakar Bayraktars, it can also carry the brand new, and unfortunately I don't think I can even pronounce this one, but it's the Kizililma, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is a uh, jet 
power drone, much like the Blyroctar, that has improved abilities. It can also carry 10 Super Cobras that can carry anti-ship missiles and also perform other missions. And it also has 12 Seahawk helicopters. These are usually purpose-made to carry anti-ship missiles. And so once again, this is giving the Turkish Navy a massive advantage. Just talking about their submarine fleet and submarines, uh, well, their submarine fleet and their LHC alone, they could give the Russian Black Sea Fleet a bloody nose if it actually turned into outright blows. But then again, Turkey is a part of NATO, and so we probably won't see those blows ever exchanged. We will probably see a very tense standoff in between the Turkish Navy and the Russian Navy as Turkey continues to help those ships deliver the grain that is desperately needed around some parts of the world. Moving on outside of Turkey, and hopefully Turkey will carry through on their promise that they made earlier, we are now going to be moving on up into the area of Belarus to talk about the Wagner a little bit more. We have heard today that Dmitry Utkin, and fairly interestingly, before we even get into what Dmitry Utkin said, here is a picture of him. Boy, you know, you don't see people like that every day. It appears that Mr. Clean has had a rough time in life. And you can also see that he has a very interesting tattoo right there, which is of two lightning bolts in a rectangular field. Uh, some people may know that that is the symbol of the Waffen-SS, uh, or the Waffen-Schutzstaffel, which was the... Uh, which was the bad guys, really. The, if anyone in Nazi Germany was especially a bad guy, it was the Waffen-SS, and especially the Waffen-SS Death's Head, which ran the concentration camps, death camps, labor camps, and so on. And it appears he has a neat little tattoo right there just showing off that, you know, apparently fighting Nazism in Ukraine, one must be a Nazi yourself to be able to do something like that. Moving on from that, however, Dmitry Utkin said a very interesting thing on Telegram today. He said that Gerasimov and Shoigu should be held responsible for the genocide of the Russian people, the murder of tens of thousands of Russian citizens, and surrender of Russian territories to the enemy. And this was intentional, just like the murder of Russian citizens and genocide. So, you know, the guy who uh, has a tattoo of a genocidal group, apparently he's very conscientious about further genocides committed by really anyone. So good to know that there are great upstanding members of the community out there that are looking out for everyone's best interests and always side with just the right kind of people. You know, I'm, I'm sure that having a tattoo of the Schutzstaffel means that you're a nice guy who wouldn't do anything um, extremely heinous or outright criminal against humanity. And of course, I'm just kidding, this guy is pretty sick. And it looks like he even has some kind of a Nazi Eagle swastika tattoo down here. You can't really see it too well, but I was trying to figure out what we were looking at the entire time I was talking about this. But yeah, this guy is nuts. And th these are also the kind of guys that make up the Wagner unit. And we can see that they're still not really letting the whole coup thing go. But seeing their convoys and the condition they're in, they don't really have a lot of weaponry to work with at this point to conduct a coup. And according to Ukrainian intelligence, and uh, the uh, Deputy Defense Minister, Hanna Malier, uh, she said that there are only a few hundred Wagner fighters in Belarus, and it appears that they are purely on a training mission in that area. And so with that, we now have to move all the way down from there to continue on with a small update of what has been going on at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. According to information that Yuri Don Press has been getting, quote-unquote, objects were mined within Russian-occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the Crimean Titan chemical plant. The situation has not changed yet, and the mining works have not been carried out there. This is according to Andrei Yusov of the Ukrainian government. We'll be looking at that situation a little bit more. We're not going to be, uh, we're not going to be giving it the kind of coverage that we gave before on this channel, because it appears that that all dissipated really quickly uh, after Budinov just came out and said, oh, it's no big deal. And we really did play into that a lot before because it seemed from what they were saying it was quite serious. This time we're going to be giving it a little bit more leeway just because of how it went last time. So that is the situation right now at the power plant, but I'm not going to talk about how serious it could be or anything like that because the last time... And I can't say this enough. The last time we did that and the last time we've said exactly what the Ukrainian intelligence was saying, uh, we were kind of left high and dry in the course of a single day when they just went and reversed everything and said it's not that big of a deal. So we'll just be covering that. We'll be looking at it. Uh, but we're not going to be playing that up too much unless if it actually starts to go into a meltdown or something similar. 
But with that, that is all of the breaking news we have today. I thank you all so much once again for watching. If you all did enjoy, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and support us on Patreon. Link in the description below. And I hope to see you all tomorrow for the next War Summary, and also tonight for our Sunday night fundraiser as well, as we find a nonprofit to help out in their continuing efforts to help support and save the lives of people in Ukraine. And so with that, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one.